Now remember, like I said, you're looking for a test case here that's very favorable to our side. And, and the more explicitly religious statements we get, uh, the better off we are, uh, you know, in terms of proving that this is just putting religion in there. Uh, Buckingham made so many gaffes like this that they, they tried to keep him off the stand. The defense team didn't put him on the witness list. Uh, they, all the other members of the school board they called didn't want Buckingham on there. So the plaintiff's team called him as a hostile witness and put him up on the stand and really grilled him. And that led to some of the more amusing um, parts of this trial. They had two problems. Uh, the first problem was uh, Buckingham just wasn't very bright. Um, well, let's not mince words. Uh, Buckingham had the IQ of a pot roast. <laughs> this, th this man really wasn't very smart. Uh, when he got on the witness stand, after they got through the, the sort of obligatory state your name, you know, occupation, etc., one of the first questions that the uh, Steve Harvey attorney for the uh, plaintiffs asked him was, do you have an understanding in very simple terms of what intelligent design stands for? What does it teach? Asking the man who wants to put intelligent design into the classroom what intelligent design is, you'd think he'd have an answer. Here's his answer. Other than what I've expressed that scientists, a lot of scientists, don't ask me the names, I can't tell you where it came from, a lot of scientists believe that back through time, something, molecules, amoeba, whatever, evolved into the complexities of life we have now. Now that's it's kind of a muddled definition of evolution, but it's a lot closer to being a definition of evolution than it is to being a definition of intelligent design. <laughs> so the attorney was a bit baffled. Uh, as it turned out, ignorance was not his most serious problem. The second problem that Buckingham had was that uh, he wasn't terribly honest. Oh, let's not mince words again. He got on the stand and lied through his teeth. And I'll give you a couple of really good examples of this. One of the controversial questions was whether Buckingham had used the term creationism in advocating the new policy. Uh, everybody said he did. The newspapers had quoted him saying he did. And he said, no, I said intelligent design. I never said creationism. Remember, we're trying to prove that intelligent design and creationism are the same thing. If you use the terms interchangeably, that looks good for our side. So they get him on the witness stand, and he was absolutely adamant that he had never, not only he had never used this term, nobody connected with this had ever said creationism. Here's the, uh, a few questions from the testimony. With respect to creationism, it's your testimony that creationism was never said by any board member, including you, at any board meeting. Isn't that correct? That's true. And it's your testimony that creationism was never said to any reporters after any board meeting. That's true. And it's your testimony that you never talked about creationism, or to your knowledge, none of the board members ever talked about creationism among themselves. Yes. So after getting him about 100 different ways to, on the record, saying nobody ever talked about creationism in any context, uh, the attorney, Steve Harvey, asked for exhibit P145 to be pulled up. And on the screen pops a video of Buckingham speaking to a local TV reporter <laughs> after one of the June 2004 meetings. The book that was presented to me, he said, was laced with Darwinism from beginning to end. It's okay to teach Darwin, but you have to balance with something else, such as creationism. Do you need to see it again, Harvey asked? <laughs> no. And he was a little irritated at that point. But he had a great explanation. He came up with this very fanciful explanation. He said, well, what happened was I was walking from my car to the building, and here's this lady, and here's a cameraman, and I had in my mind all the newspaper articles saying we were talking about creationism. And I had it in my mind to make sure, make double sure, nobody talks about creationism. We're talking intelligent design. I had it in my mind. But I was like a deer in the headlights of a car, and I misspoke. Pure and simple, I made a human mistake. So after spending a half an hour denying that he had ever said the word creationism under any context, he suddenly has complete recall of what was going on through his mind before he said creationism. I call this the Homer Simpson alibi. And this is from an episode of The Simpsons where, where Homer says, don't say you were at a bar, don't say you were at a bar. I was at a bar. Oh! So Buckingham is Homer Simpson. A second example of Buckingham's dishonesty, and this may be an even better one. One of the key questions in the case was where the money came from to buy all of the copies of Love, Pandas, and People. They had about 60 copies of it. Originally, they were going to give them to all of the students in the ninth grade science classrooms. They decided that was a little too explicit. So they ended up putting them in the library and telling them you can check it out, encouraging them to check it out. 60 copies of this book just showed up at the school one day, and nobody knew where the money came from. And so before the trial started, during the discovery phase, the attorneys for the plaintiffs were trying to find out who the heck paid for these things. 
And so they asked all of the witnesses, who paid for these things? Who paid for them? Nobody would say. Nobody knew, apparently. They all said they didn't know. So here's a January 2005 deposition with Buckingham and the attorney going at him, asking him, the school district received a number of copies of the book, correct? Yes. Do you know how many? 60. I haven't seen them. Do you know where that money came from? No, I don't. You have no idea? Well, I have thoughts, but I don't know. Well, what are your thoughts? I think it could have something to do with Alan Bonsell, who was the board president. Well, why do you think that? Well, he was president at the time, so I just deduced from that. Well, at the time, uh, the attorneys genuinely didn't know who had paid for these and really were trying to find out. As it turns out, <laughs> I love this, Buckingham had gotten up in front of his church and asked them to donate money to buy these books. And they did. And then he wrote a check out of his own checking account for $850, and he gave it to Alan Bonsell. And Alan Bonsell, for some reason, gave the money to his father, who went and bought the books, and then they showed up. It's a pretty astonishing lie to tell. Under oath, no less, during a deposition. Bonsell told the same lie. Even though he had given the check to his father to buy the books, during his deposition, he said, I have no idea where the money came from. None whatsoever. You know, they just <laughs> pleaded ignorance the entire time. Uh, in fact, this was during the trial, one of the more entertaining moments of the trial was that when Bonsell was on the witness stand, Judge Jones actually interrupted a cross-examination and took over the questioning himself on this issue and started asking him why didn't, in fact, he said to the attorneys, give me a copy of his deposition. And they brought a copy of Bonsell's deposition up there, and the judge opened it and said, you said this. You said you didn't know. Why didn't you say you got the check from Buckingham and you gave it to your father? Well, you know, he kind of fumbled around. I don't know if any of you ever testified in court before, but it's a pretty nerve-wracking experience. I mean, it can shake the nerves of, you know, somebody who's pretty confident. For Bonsell in that situation, to have a federal judge, you know, on the stand basically accuse you of perjury under oath. Okay. <laughs> Not sure how to get that off there. Oh, there we go. Hold on, I can get this. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Sign. It's a sign, yeah. God doesn't want me to give this speech. <laughs> but as I was saying, I, I suspect that Bonsell may have needed to change underwear uh, at that point. I suspect he was a little shaken up by that. Anyway, back to the summer of 2004, the board is discussing this. They finally draw a line in the sand, and they pass this policy, and they, and they insert the following statement into the uh, science curriculum. Students will be made aware of the gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including but not limited to intelligent design. Note, origins of life is not taught. Now, I don't know if you caught this or not, but when I showed the picture of the cover of, uh, of Pandas and People, the subtitle of it, includes biological origins. So they insert a statement into there saying, we don't talk about origins. And yet the textbook itself is subtitled origins. They also inserted, uh, required the, student, or the teachers to read this statement uh, before they taught the section on evolution. They were to read this statement to their students. The Pennsylvania academic standards require students to learn about Darwin's theory of evolution and eventually to take a standardized test of which evolution is a part. Because Darwin's theory is a theory, it is still being tested as new evidence is discovered. The theory is not a fact. Gaps in the theory exist for which there is no evidence. A theory is defined as a well-tested explanation that unifies a broad range of explanation, of observations. Not a bad definition of theory, really, although they're misusing it. Intelligent design is an explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view. Remember, we don't talk about origin of life, and yet, we want you to read these things. The reference book of Pandas and People is available for students to see if they would like to explore this view in an effort to gain an understanding of what intelligent design actually involves. As is true with any theory, students are encouraged to keep an open mind. School leaves the discussion of the origins of life to individual students and their families. As a standards-driven district, class instruction focuses upon preparing students to achieve proficiency on standards-based assessments. Not likely that this is actually in the science standards. <laughs> 